It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning on this beautiful day. And so glad that you're able to be with us today and just excited about what God has for us today, what God has for you today. And I know that God's going to do something extra special for you today. I want to mention to you just some announcements and things going on. Uh, one, we're excited to have our state administrative bishop with us, uh, Dr. Bill Claypool. And so, just so excited to have him. Give him a hand clap. He's here with us today. Uh, just, uh, yeah, we'll say more about it, but you're in for a great treat today. And then this evening, we are hosting our Northeast Arkansas for the Church of God, the World Missions Rally. And, uh, and, and it's not just for the pastors, it's for all of us because and we're all a part of World Missions. And, and so um, it is important. We're doing that at 6 o'clock this evening. And we'd love for you to be here for that. You, you support World Missions um, every week here at this church. And, and it would be, allow you an opportunity to, to see some of the fruits of what you've done and what you've helped with over the last several years and several months and so forth. And, and so, um, so if you can come, um, be a part of that. And uh, again, this is be a great time. And then starting this week, this is Easter week, okay? Which means next Sunday is Easter, okay? And, uh, and so what do you do leading up to Easter? You invite people to church. Uh, and you know, I, I believe everybody should be in church every week, but Easter is a great, great time for everybody to be in church. We have invitations out in the foyer, sitting on the table underneath the iPad out there, that if you want to invite somebody, you can give it to them. Um, because Easter is for us all, and, and, and that's what it's for. And so we want um, to have people here. Our goal is to see people come to know the Lord on Easter. Wouldn't that be awesome if your friend, your family, your neighbor, uh, your co-worker, your classmate um, came to the Lord on Easter Sunday? And that, that, that would just be an incredible thing. Well, you've got some invitations. And so, look, uh, if you picked up a bulletin, most of the bulletins have an invitation in them as well. And so uh, pick up uh, one of those bulletins, take an invitation, invite somebody. If yours didn't have an invitation in it, then pick up um, one of the invitations out there in the foyer. And we certainly want you to do that. And then, again, one of the things that we do every year, it's just one of the things we enjoy doing. Uh, after Easter service, we love to see the kids out on the grounds. They do an Easter egg hunt after service. So we get to have a great family time watching them pick up eggs and things like that and candy and so forth and watching the adults watching them is about as much fun as anything but then we have a community easter egg hunt that's going to be on saturday from one to four and we're participating in that and helping um, with workers many of you volunteered to help with that and certainly um, if you haven't volunteered and you'd like to uh, we can always use more help with that, and that's going to be one to four at the sports complex uh, on next Saturday. And I've been looking at it. When I looked last week, I thought, boy, the weather looked bad. Now it looks great. We're going to have great weather for next weekend. So, uh, so those Easter egg hunts will be able to go on and be able to have fun, and, and, and they're also a way to do ministry. So we certainly want you to be a part of that. But then leading up to, uh, to Easter services this week, Every single day, starting tomorrow at noon, we're having Holy Week services with our um, Bible Ministerial Alliance. And so um, we want you to be able to go to those things. Um, we have tomorrow's going to be at First Baptist at noon. Um, Tuesday is going to be at First Methodist. In fact, um, kicking off Holy Week services is your very own Brother Frankie Reed is going to be kicking off. He's the Vice President of Ministerial Alliance. And then... Um, he's going to be doing it. I get to do the one at the Methodist Church. So we're going to, we're going to rule Church of God is represented in both of the uh, first two services. I think that's awesome that we get to. And then on um, Wednesday, we're going to be at um, um, Faith Temple. And uh, what a great time it always is at Brother Willie Williams' church. And we're going to have a great time there. Thursday, you're hosting. You're hosting that service. And guess who's preaching here that day? Brother Willie Williams is preaching here. And then Friday, we're going to culminate it at the First Christian Church. And um, you want to go there because every one of them have a lunch. But there's going to be a special lunch that Friday 
uh, that the ministerial alliance is taken care of. And then, um, and again, Good Friday service is going to be at, at, um, at First Christian, and it's going to end with a bang with um, Sister Vera James. If you've, if you've never heard Vera preach, you've never heard anybody preach. All right, um, Sister Vera is a ball of fire. We're going to have a great time. But here's one of the great things. The Holy Week services that we have at the Ministerial Alliance, we get to share Jesus all week. But one of the other things it does, the every bit of the offerings that, that take place for the Bible Ministerial Alliance does not just go into the fund just to keep. It goes into a benevolence fund that helps people throughout this community. It helps people with different things. It helps people with um, gas, with um, bills and things. And it started about 10 years ago, and it's been a phenomenal thing that we've been able to do in this community at that benevolence fund so that all the churches work together to help our community. And so again, Holy Week services are going to be great. We want you, if you're able to participate, if you work, and if you get an hour for lunch, you'll, be, you'll have a 30-minute service, a 30-minute lunch, be able to be back at work by 1 o'clock. So what greater thing can you do uh, on your lunch break than that? So um, we're excited about it. We want to ask you to stand to your feet. We want to begin with prayer. And how many of you want God to touch you today? I mean, I want God to touch me today. I want God to touch you. Hey, we know we've got some prayer needs. We want to continue to remember for Brother Allen in prayer that, that God would touch him. And I know he is touching Brother Allen. And, and he's going to but also pray for Sister Connie. She's there so long, and right there by her husband's side, and that, that's what she wants to do, but she needs strength. So remember her in prayer as well. Continue to remember Sister Mary and Sister Wanda and so many others in prayer. Um, but let's go ahead and just welcome the Lord. Heavenly Father, we love you today, and we thank you, dear God, that we have the opportunity to come into your house to worship you, dear God, in spirit and in truth, dear God. We thank you, dear God, that that you've given us this beautiful day, dear Lord, to honor you and to magnify you, dear Lord. On this day, we thank you for your grace and mercy. God, as we come to you, we welcome you in your house today, knowing, dear Lord, that you want to speak to your people. You want to touch your people, dear God. And Lord, I ask you today, Lord, touch especially those people, dear God, who've been impacted by these storms, dear God. Lord, the, the, the churches, the schools, the, the families, the, the people, dear God, who've been injured, dear God, I pray for your touch on The people who've lost loved ones, dear God, I pray comfort for them. The people who've lost their property, dear God, just remind them that you're their provider, dear God. And Lord, I pray, dear Lord, that you would help us, dear God, to be able to minister and to touch in various ways. We thank you, dear God, that you put your hand of protection over us during this time, dear God, and, and that, that we weren't touched by it. But since we weren't touched physically by it, let us reach out and touch others, dear God. And let us be vessels, dear God, to touch those who were hit by these things. God, we also pray, Lord, for Brother Allen, dear God, for his healing, dear God. We pray, dear Lord, for, for Sister Connie, dear God, give her strength. For Sister Mary, dear God, and Sister Wanda, just minister to those precious ladies. And Lord, for everyone here today, dear God, we just ask that you would pour your spirit out on them. For those who are watching online, I pray your hand upon them. In the name of Jesus, amen. As you get ready to worship the Lord, why don't you take your phone and go to Facebook Live and share the service, and maybe somebody will be touched by it even online. Let's worship the Lord. Thank you. 
I absolutely believe nothing is impossible with God. We're going to get ready. We're going to worship the Lord with our tithes and with our offerings this morning. And we want to honor him with that. You know, this is the first Sunday of the month. And we um, do our project offering on the first Sunday of the month. So we want to do that. And for those of you ladies, you, you have a great reason to, to give to the project offering. I don't know if you noticed, but you got all new commodes in the ladies' room. I know we're not supposed to say commode in church. I, I don't know. But they, they have to be paid for, you know. Um, and, and they are things we have to have. But they are, you hate to say they're beautiful, but they're beautiful. Uh, they're beautiful and they're new, you know. So, uh, but, you know, we've got the new gutters that we've got on the church and all these things. We've got some other projects that we're just continuing to work on and, and update and upgrade some things. And so uh, that's what that project goes for. But also want to let you know, next Sunday, on Easter Sunday, we're going to do a special offering. And we want to do that since it gives time for people to get prepared for it. Um, we're going to do a special offering for Tornado Relief. Um, for the wind community, for Jacksonville. Um, you know, we actually had a couple of churches that were impacted by that. Some ministers in our denomination, they had their houses and properties messed up pretty bad. And, and so, um, you know, we're going to be in all that. The, 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 we'll go through our state office. We'll be distributed for different ways and also helping with different things in, in the recovery process. You know, while we've been, we were protected. And the others, I believe, had a lot of protection over them. A lot of people lost some things. That, uh, that insurance won't cover everything. And insurance never does cover everything. And we know firsthand because six years ago this month, we were hit by that tornado that, that did $80,000 worth of damage. And everything was repaired. Everything was taken care of. And so we want to be a part of helping other people do that. And so that's going to be next Sunday. We're going to do that. And, 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 and we want to minister in those ways. But today, we're going to worship with our time, and we're going to worship with our project offering, and we're just going to bless the Lord. And it's always, to me, this is an exciting time to get to worship and get it. Uh, it. It should be one of the most genuine times that we have in worship. So let's prepare our hearts to give God our very best right now. Heavenly Father, we love you, and we thank you, dear God, that we get to bring our offerings and our tithes to you this morning. And God, we ask you in the name of Jesus, dear Lord, we ask, dear God, that you would just bless every giver this morning. And dear Lord, that everyone would have that opportunity to give unto you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship with our giving right now. There's honey in the rock, water in the sun, and on the ground.
up your hands for just a moment and give him just a moment of praise and honor him right now. He does deserve the glory. He deserves all the honor. We're not here for any man to see us. We're here to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Guys, so would you give these guys a hand clap? Appreciate you. You can be seated. I'm gonna ask Brother Frank and Sister Kathy if they're gonna bring the kids up here. They're gonna they're gonna bless you um, here in just a moment. And um, as they're getting ready to come up here and, and, and share with us, um, I want to go ahead and introduce our bishop. Um, he, he'll be coming up to share with us, but. It, it is such a privilege to have Brother Claypool with us. And, and he's been in Arkansas since 2018. By the time he finishes up his appointment this time, he will be the longest tenured state overseer, I believe, in the history of the state of Arkansas. Um, I believe six years is the most we've ever had anybody in Arkansas. And so uh, I don't know if he say, thinks that's good or bad, but he's learned to do some things since he's been here. Um, he's learned how to call the hogs. He can do it all right for a Kentucky guy. Um, but what you'll find out, and again, over these last five years of getting to know Brother Claypool and Sister Claypool, this guy is as genuine as anybody I've ever known about caring for people, not just the pastors, but for everybody within the church. And when he says we care, uh, I've kind of stolen that from him because I, I just think it's a great thing the church should be known for is caring. And so um, you're in for, but not only that, the, Brother Claypool is one of the great preachers in the church of God. You'll see him in the summertime. He's at different camp meetings preaching all over the place. And my goodness, he also has organized some of the best camp meetings we've ever had in the state. And this year, Camp meeting is going to be just down the road in Jonesboro, so you'll be able to get to go to that. And so, um, so you're going to welcome him when he comes and shares with us, and let God touch you that way. But you're going to enjoy these kids. Before y'all do anything, y'all smile at everybody. Uh, smile at them. Don't smile at me. Y'all smile at them. Okay. All right. Y'all smile. All right.
What a great job. Would you give him a good hand? Thank you. Thank you, young man. Yeah. What a great uh, opportunity it is to be here today and to be in the presence of the Lord. It's always good to be with Pastor Danny and Miss Tanya and Danette and Katie Beth. We love Josh. We haven't met Caleb. You'd think we'd meet him in, in five years, but maybe we will. Amen. And, uh, but I just love this family, and Joy sends her love today. She was involved in Teen Talent yesterday, and so I've been doing the uh, uh, tornado, uh, funeral, uh, operation on the foot, <laughs> and all kinds of things yesterday. So I got in last night about 9 o'clock. You saw me sitting down. I don't have a religious spirit. I have a sciatica and a surgery on my foot. So I'm going to enjoy middle age. It's wonderful. Isn't it? <laughs> Amen. I was cutting up with one of the guys. If you see me kind of limping around today, it's not because I'm shouting, it's because my foot's hurting, amen? And guess what I'm going to preach on this morning? Uh, but yeah, miracles, uh, the prophetic implications of a miracle. But I just want you to know how much we love you and appreciate you, and I'm telling you, this is a wonderful group of kids here, and we love the reeds, and uh, thank you for your uh, all that you do in the kingdom, amen? And congratulations to Katie Beth, you know, that's hard for uh, Brother... Uh, Danny and I to say because we were we're tight with our daughters, amen. And I'm ten months into this thing, and I'm doing good. I even gave my deer jerky to my new son-in-law. That's pretty good for a redneck, isn't it? Amen. <laughs> well, there's a few of y'all that resemble that out there today with me. I thought I was in Arkansas, amen. <laughs> Praise God. So we're when I heard that and and uh, and and heard Brother Danny give his affirmation. Of course, we think so much of uh, Sister Katie Beth and excited. Uh, for them, amen. Uh, Joy says right now we have a grand dog, but hopefully in the and the years to come we'll have a grand baby, and then you forget about all that, amen. And well, man, this is a rough crowd this morning. I'll tell you what, I don't know if you're if you haven't seen me in a while, or I'm that ugly, or what it is. And uh, but I believe that the Lord has something special for us tonight's going to be a good night. Uh, Doctor Terrell Brinson is unable to come because of the loss of. Uh, Bishop Larry Timmerman, 83, 84 years old, one of our phenomenal ministers in the Church of God. I'm sure he's done camp meetings here. And he uh, had pancreatic cancer. My dad went to be with the Lord two years ago with that, a uh, retired police chief. And uh, Larry uh, didn't, he's like my dad. He didn't die in doubt. He died in faith and uh, uh, went to be with the Lord. Uh, I think he and his Jan, 60 some years of marriage. And uh, Brother Terrell was very close to that family. So I'll be uh, not only traveling the state this week, we'll be doing uh, the World Mission Rally. So tonight I'll be promoting the program. We want you to come. And it's not going to be a very long program. We're going to talk about ministry. People give to ministry. They don't give to projects. So we're not here tonight to, to do anything weird or uh, to play on you. We're just people who have open hands in the presence of God. How many understand that? You give to your church. You bless here. So there's no uh, uh, no pretense, and so tonight the youth director and his family will be here, and uh, so we're excited uh, about that and have an opportunity uh, to be with you. So you want to pray for that family. Yesterday I had the opportunity to be with the Abbots, uh, some of our ministers, retired minister, that 90 years old, lost his wife last week. I was with her about a Saturday ago, had an opportunity to pray with them. And then we were in Jacksonville, our church in Jacksonville, uh, the Loop Road Church was hit, minimal damage, and also in wind, uh, minimal damage, but a lot, we have insurance, but uh, a lot of devastation. We're networking with God's Pit Crew, uh, Samaritan's Purse, our people have come together. Little Rock, we don't have any proper, as far as any proper church, uh, Church of God representation there, just, we, we're just out of the extremities. There is a Hispanic church that operates under uh, the San Antonio office that we've reached out to at different times, and we love them. But we're networking with the Assembly of God. One of the things that happens is when these type of things come, the body of Christ comes together. This church understands that. You know, we, we appreciate our tribe. We're still uh, finding our folks that were hurt and uh, different ones whose homes were uh, affected, and we're going to bless them, and we'll be good stewards of any money. We're working on getting a QR code in our state office next week, but even if we can't get that quick enough, if a pastor will give you the instructions, and I promise you that we will make sure that not only is our churches and our pastors, but if we know of anyone in our own tribe 
that has needs, we will help them. And then extended kingdom and family around. We did that with the Jonesboro uh, tornado and things of that nature. So uh, just pray for these people. A lot of devastation. While I was um, uh, praying uh, Friday, uh, the tornado came right up out of Hot Springs, right over our campground, right over the state office and state uh, parsonage. And before we knew it, it had hit uh, uh, Little Rock right around uh, Rodney Parham, where the old parsonage used to be and the old state office used to be. A lot of devastation there. Came through there, went through Jacksonville, and then uh, no sooner than that subsided, of course, up through Memphis and that area came through um, and really devastated wind. And our church in Wynn, we have three, is starting to grow again. And it uh, is right across from the school that you saw. So hopefully we will be able to set, we have Tyson Chicken that is setting up to give us some uh, uh, aid there. We have some churches out of Mississippi that we have helped that are going to come. We've networked, as I said, with God's Pit Crew, which is a uh, subsidiary of the benevolent department of the Church of God. And they're uh, networking with the assembly. And some of our parking lots may not be large enough. So uh, it's a beautiful picture of watching the kingdom come together. Because in the kingdom, we don't compete. We complete one another. So you all understand that because this week you will worship with Methodist brothers and Baptist brothers and tall folks and short folks and Caucasian folks and Asian. Come on now. And it looks like the kingdom and all kinds of shades and styles because we've all been baptized into one body. Whether we be bond or free Jew or Gentile, we've been made to drink in the spirit. So we are brothers. This morning I had an opportunity at the Comfort Inn. There was, a number, there was some kind of incident that took place and people were crying out in the hall and immediately when I walked out, uh, I saw them and I said, I don't want to be intrusive, but I am a Church of God minister. And uh, immediately I began to pray for those people and God uh, uh, began to give comfort and uh, we'll find out later uh, what's happening there. Don't forget uh, uh, to pray for these rallies as we crisscross the state this week. Don't forget uh, the women's conference. My wife is probably somewhere today, amen, and uh, wants me to make you aware of that. It's going to be a phenomenal meeting. It's in Hot Springs. It's not too late uh, for you to get involved in that. Some uh, tremendous speakers. Joy always brings uh, a, a good stream for the old, the young, the new, the tall. I mean, we just cover the gamut, same way we do. So that if you come, you're going to receive from somebody. And then uh, our camp meeting this year will be June uh, the uh, 6th through the 9th. We'll be having a Monday night credential-only minister training session. We formed that for pastors and credential leaders so that we can come in, have an opportunity to pour into the people that pour into you. Amen? And then the, the week will all come together, and there will be uh, meetings during the day and the evening. I understand there's going to be some afterglows for youth and things like that. We're bringing some of that stuff back. And so you'll get to meet your new youth director if you haven't already. I think you've already met him and had a meeting here. So they, they had a phenomenal day yesterday. And it was a good win for them to have their first team talent under their belt. And then camp is going to be phenomenal this year. The campground, we are on point there. And uh, we've about remodeled and fixed and cleaned up and, and even... Um, uh, plumbing and things of that nature. So, so I said, Brother Faith, well, why would you like to say all that this morning when we need you to preach? Well, you're, this is your place. Uh, that's your campground. Your church of God, you're a part of it. You have invested in it. And I want you to know that uh, I'm glad that I can come to a place that is mature like this. And there's sometimes you don't see us and uh, you can feel disconnected because of COVID and things of that nature that we walk through. But I want to applaud you for all that you've done in the kingdom. And I want to tell you, you have some of the greatest leaders, not only in the church of God, but in the kingdom, in the pankies and in the reeds. Amen? Amen. Well, I thought somebody would give us a look. And I'm not saying that just to say that. You know, somebody said, when you lather people up, the shade's coming. Have you ever heard that one? I'm not just lathering them up. And uh, I will tell you, your pastor will even console me when the Kentucky Wildcats lose. So I'm just not just thinking about it. You know, I've been rooting for the Hogs, the they're my second favorite team, so uh, one of these decades, somebody in the SEC is, y'all don't even care, do you? Amen. <laughs> All right, so if you have your Bibles this morning, go with me to John's, uh, Mark's Gospel, chapter 6 and verse 52. John, uh, Mark's Gospel, chapter 6 and verse 52. 
I want to talk about the prophetic implications of a miracle. What are the attributes of a miracle? What are the things that take place in a miracle? There are three things that you're going to see in this story, and I may not get to them uh, with an overview. Uh, and that is facts and food and faith. And those are the three components of the miracle. But, and I, I may allude to that, but what I want you to see is the three prophetic keys. When I talk about prophetic keys, uh, as people of the Spirit, we, number one, can preach the Word in an expository way. We can do that. We can do that in context. We can do that uh, in language. We can understand that. And then we can preach the Word of God inductively. The Word of God is uh, inductive simply means Jesus stepped down in a boat. He sat down in a boat. He stood up in a boat. He spoke out of a boat. Amen? Uh, he laid down in a boat. And he, walked, he got out of the boat and walked on the water. So there's transition that you can use in a text. And then we're also people of the Spirit. We can pick up the book and not hurt the context. And the book uh, that is the Word of God, as we breathe on it, it can breathe on us. There are truths that can come from that. That's the prophetic implication. So I will contextually do my best to, to lay the groundwork for what is taking place in this text. But I want to pull from this three, three components that I believe that are in the earth today that are rising up for this revival that we started and we saw in Asbury and at Lee and different places like that, Katie Beth, that are starting on these college campuses and things of that nature that are rising up. And I want you to know that God never allows anything just to happen to brush over. He's trying to send us some kind of exposure. And I apologize to the uh, camera lady. I have ADHD and I'm anointed. Amen. So I will move. And so I'm walking on the hilltop right here. So, you know, I'll, I'll tell you later if you really want to know what happened to my foot. Uh, when you get older, I talked to a guy today in the men's restroom. He said, Brother Claypool, I understand this pollen, but he said, I deal with arthritis. Amen. <laughs> All right. As long as you're not dealing with rigor mortis, you're okay. <laughs> Amen. That's what my grandpa used to say. Uh, so let me zero in here before I just get all over the map. I want to uh, bring my mind into place, but I wanted to visit with you. So uh, Mark's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 52, that's what I want to zero in on. Three components, the whole scope of the story, and I want to draw it in so that you'll understand and see these three particular keys that brought this miracle. Everybody understands that I'm going to kind of paint with a broad brush and then I'm going to come in and bring it in into sync. Everybody got that? All right. Uh, the scripture said, for they considered not the miracles of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. Terry, if I get a little loud, just break me down. It's good to see him and AJ today. Uh, and we love them very much. So, uh, for they considered not the miracles of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. Before we get started and pray, I want you to think about who were these people that made this statement. They were the maturated folks. When I use the word maturated, I mean they were the mature people. They're the seasoned people. They're us. Father, I ask you to bless this sermon today. Lay your hand upon me as I engage with these people in your word to speak the word of the Lord. I ask you right now to lay your hand upon those who are in trying times and difficult times. Lord, we thank you for the leadership of this house, the gate watchers of this house. Oh, we're thankful, God, that you have sustained them through troubling times and tra traumatic times. God, we're thankful that you have sustained us now as in our weakness you will give us strength to minister to this state where brokenness and where devastation has taken place. God, I ask you to lay your hand upon your people today and do your work among the house of, in the house of God. In Jesus' name, the church said amen and amen. I want to talk to you about, first of all, the external aspect of a miracle and then the internal aspect of a miracle. You know, anytime you see a miracle in the Word of God, it does one of two things. Number one, it teaches us a spiritual lesson, and it also, number one, it teaches us the power of God, and then internally, externally, it teaches us the power of God, and internally, it teaches us uh, a deep spiritual lesson. And you know, when God began to move in the Old Testament, in, or excuse me, in the New Testament, in the person of Jesus Christ, and he began to uh, talk about the healing of the ten lepers. 
He was not just dealing with putting a thumb back on a hand. He was not just dealing with putting a toe back on a foot or an eyebrow back over an eye. He was drawing a prophetic proclamation and picture and a parody that Jesus would be the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. He was dealing with a issue called sin. And we have to understand that God does not tolerate sin. It's not popular to say that in the culture today because we feel like we have to sneak up on people. But God never adjusts his holiness for you or me or anyone. Uh, how can we think that we are going to get into heaven uh, where there is no sin if there's sin in our life? That's a good place to say amen. amen. Now, God will help us and empower us to live righteous and sober in this present world. He works with us through our brokenness and our repentance and godly sorrow works the maturity in our life and helps us to get victory in areas of struggles in our life. God is not looking uh, at someone to take them out that is drawing nigh unto him. He's more worried about the person who is religious and thinks they have no issue. He abhors iniquity and he holds it, them at arm's length. And so when Jesus healed the ten lepers, uh, he was drawing a picture of Calvary. That Jesus would walk without the gate. And you know that only a couple came back and gave praise with a loud voice. And, and uh, you understand all the things that took place in leprosy. They put the lepers on the outside of the, uh, of the camp. And on Testament covenant time, you had to render yourself on the other side of the street in the Levitical concept that you were unclean. But Jesus was saying that my blood is going to cleanse. I'm going to walk without the gate. I'm going to go down to Villa Villa Rosa. And you'll preach about it next week. We're going to be flogged. Today is the triumphant entry. It was the beginning of, of the sacrament week. Beginning of the sacrifice. And he said, I will be hanged, suspended between heaven and earth. And when my blood eats down the cross and it begins to puddle uh, on the hill of Golgotha. This hill that was created in the mind of God in creation for the purpose of God. He said it will eke out a message through the corridors of hell that, re that revival and renewal and redemption and resurrection has come. When Jesus healed the ten lepers, he was not just taking care of an external issue, he was dealing with an internal issue. Such was the case when Jesus uh, literally uh, turned the water into wine. It was not just taking physical H2O and going through a procurement process that's completely different than ours. And it was about 32 times 32 times 32 that they could even get to the nth degree of eating what we would call cough syrup today. So it was not so that a bunch of Pentecostals could say, should we or shouldn't we? Somebody say amen. amen. The context here is what Paul said, don't be drunk with wine where it is uh, where it is sin or debauchery in the Greek. But he said, rather be baptized in the Holy Spirit and filled and overflowed with new wine. So such was the case when Jesus took six water pots, the number of man, and he filled it up to the brim because up until that point, all they could do was fill the water up to the brim. You could only get so far. But aren't you glad that Jesus said on the great day of the feast, he said, if any man come after me and they thirst out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. I like it because he used earthen vessels, Katie Beth, you and I. Because Paul said it like this. He said, we house and embody in this earthen vessel uh, 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 the power of God. And it's not of the measure of the flesh, but it is of the excellency and the power of God. He said, I'm going to take some clay pots and I'm going to put my treasure in it. And what he was doing when he turned water into wine and caused the governor of the feast to stand up and declare, he has saved the best for last. He was drawing the picture of Peter, an uneducated fisherman, who would stagger out in the streets of Jerusalem when the elect in the synagogue could not catch and understand what was happening or define Pentecost on that day because up to that point it was nothing more than a festival and a feast but this uneducated fisherman would be moved upon by the spirit of God and would speak the language of the harvest come on here now in 14 different languages it would tell the story of redemption of Jesus but he was not just showing the external power to turn water into wine he was saying I'm going to give you the new wine of my spirit and in the last day saith God I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh sons and daughters will prophesy old men will see dreams and young men will have visions and upon my handmaids and upon my servants I will take a broad brush of my glory that you've been singing about and I will empower my church hallelujah 
So when Jesus works a miracle, he doesn't just do something externally. He does something internally. And in the context of this uh, chapter, when you begin to look at it, there's several things that they're dealing with. And you know the story. In Mark's Gospel, chapter 6, they're dealing with Herodias. And they're dealing with John the Baptist. And they're dealing with uh, taking uh, the message by two. They're dealing with Sabbath day teachings and all of these things that are taking place. And unclean spirits that are coming out. But, but when we get to this particular part of the scripture, and I told you contextually, I would tell you where we are in this text and you can see the sequence but I want to just zero in on the paragraph about the, the loaves and the fish. You've heard it preached for many years. Jesus had been ministering now for days and suddenly the people of God become overwhelmed. He's been sharing uh, infallible teachings and truths and, and prophetic implications and now they are pushing up against the shore. When you study the particular area of where that miracle took place, I've been there. It's on the Sea of Galilee. It does not have sand like Destin, Florida like we would think it would have. It does not have a, a sandy seashore. It is a body of water that's pushed up. It reminds me, if I were to talk to you about what it would remind me, for those of you that have ever been around the Russellville area and the Dardanelle area, the Danville area, it, would, it looks much like those lakes there. It is called uh, the Sea of Galilee, but it is nothing more than a large lake. It's in that area where Jesus is ministering and blessing and teaching people. And now, all of a sudden, <clears throat> in the middle of this, he, he himself has to push back from the press, not a ministry, but the press of the crowd. He said in the original text, we've got to come apart lest we fall apart. I need that personal time. I need to go to the mountains. I need to go to that place where I can, that Paul said, there's a place of reprieve in God. I need to go to that place and why I go to that place, I need to withdraw myself, not from the people, but from the press of the people because I am fully God, but yet fully man. That's why the Bible said he was the word made flesh. That's why Paul said in Hebrews, he's the express image of God. And he has sat down at the right hand of majesty, and by his blood he has purged us. Amen? That's why Paul said in Colossians, in him dwells all of the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That's why the Bible tells us in Philippians chapter 2, talking about the canonic process, the form of servant, uh, pouring out. He said, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery, but made it himself of no reputation, and being found in the form and the fashion and the likeness of man. Here's what he did. He poured himself out into the tabernacle of flesh, and into the form of a servant. And he said, Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name, not just a title, but an authority, that at the name of Jesus, things in the heavens and things in the earth would bow and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus had to back up just a moment, not because he didn't love the people, he had to back up from the press and the, uh, the press of the ministry and he needed a reprieve and I love it because he went to the mountains for solace and serenity with the most high God while he was there here's what took place the Bible said the people of God began to survey the situation and here's what they did they began to survey the situation and there was 25,000 people there young man counting the women and the children and they said all we have is 200 penny worth of bread and some dinero we don't have much money and then we've got to the heel of the bread that you would find at the top shelf of Kroger in dated bread anybody know what I'm talking about it's like what I used to get when my sister, she was born seven and a half years later than I was. You know, things were perfect in our family, and all of a sudden, my sister shows up. I don't know why. You know, I love her, you know. And so, but she got out of school before I did in the 70s. I know the 70s and 80s is uh, as over some of y'all has had this morning, you know. Some of y'all uh, realize how old I am. I'm 56 years old. I come out of the 70s and 80s, you know, as a child going to school. I loved watching all these kids. My mind went back to being in children's church and being involved in all those type of things. But what would happen with us is, you know, we, had, we actually had a formation in our family where we had breakfast together at a table. We sat down at noon when we were home and we had a, a meal. Man, some of y'all look at me like a cow staring at a new gate. We actually ate in the afternoon. And you got to have a snack and you didn't get to go to uh, uh, McDonald's. That was a treat, you know. I wasn't 
My generation wasn't raised on chicken nuggets, and I don't have anything against them. I think my dad used to say that he believes all the kids are getting buffed up because they're putting stuff in their chicken nuggets. Amen. I just wish they'd done that for me. I get buffed up around this area. I need it up here. Amen. I said all that to say this. I want you to understand that my sister would beat me home for school. So whoever got home, Katie Beth, first, you know, you had brothers. I'm sure they were teenagers. They probably could eat the whole side of the kitchen out. And you probably ate like a little bird. But, uh, you know, when they get in that teenage year, anybody ever had teenage boys yet to feed? You know, you did, it, they eat and then within 30 minutes, you know. And some of us middle-aged guys still battle with that. How many of us want to talk about? We just don't have the metabolism they have. Man, this is a hard crowd this morning. Don't take this out on the pastor. I won't be here next week, I promise you. I want you to understand something. My sister would beat me, and, and, and Tanya, Sister Tanya, and she would beat me to the good part of the bread. I always got the hill. We had some Church of God Assembly of God State. You know what that is? That's baloney. I had more baloney than I had bread. And my mother would say, this is your snack. Don't let it spoil your dinner. Help me understand that. So it was dingy bread. It's what you got. If you got home late, you were lucky you got the heel. And many times you'd either have more ham or more bologna or more turkey than you had on your bread. My wife says, tells me still today, I've got more bologna on my bread than I've got anything. Amen? <laughs> Amen. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. But to say all of that, that's what they were dealing with. And here's what the church, the people of God began to do. Here's the principle. They let facts dictate to them that they were going to disperse them back into the villages. And back in the villages is a type of the world. Why would we ever think Lot came out of Sodom and went down the road to Debar just 10 miles later? It never came out of him. They came out of Egypt and they still wanted some of the food in Egypt because there was a, there was a safety that they thought, a familiarity in Egypt. Here's an Old Testament concept in the New Testament in Paul's writing in Corinthians. Come out from among them, be ye separate, touch not the unclean thing, and I'll receive you. As the church, not in the last 30 years, as the cold culture has morphed, we somehow have said to the people, we have yielded to this, we will send you back into the world to try to get you what you need. Can I tell you, God is not wanting us to use that. He's wanting us to understand that we have bread, we have water, we have meat that they know not of. No, 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 no. We have the manna that they sing about that was on the that was on the ground. We have the substance of the Father. And can I tell you that we've got more than just two hundred denarii, uh, two hundred denarii of bread, and barely enough bread to take care of all the people. And the facts say that they're sending them back in the villages, a type of the world. I want you to understand. Here's what God. He's wanting us to do. He's wanting us to realize that in the middle of these facts, suddenly a little lad, a teenager, a key to this miracle shows up. And here's what I'm talking about. This young man has an open hand in the presence of God. When I talk about an open hand, I want you to understand something. I'm talking about an Ephesians 4 model of five-fold ministry. I'm not talking about another goofy title that the Assembly of God, the Church of God, or Pentecostal Holiness, or Church of God in Christ will put on you. I'm not talking about a new certificate that we can give you. I'm talking about an apostle, a prophet, evangelist, a pastor, and a teacher. I'm talking about a function in the body that causes the church to be nurtured and come into maturation and the full stature of man can be established so that Jesus can come back in an imminent way and receive a church that he's not just dealing with the purity of their garment but the maturity of the level of the people when he said I'm coming back for a church without spot or without wrinkle he's talking about maturity level and can I tell you this little lad had five barley loaves and two small fish can I tell you that it was Gideon who put his hand down in the water it was the five-fold ministry. It was David that picked up five smooth stones out of the river. It was Noah who released the Spirit of God, the dove, out of his hand. Are you with me in this room? I'm telling you, he had the five-fold ministry. Not only did he have the five-fold ministry, five little pieces of bread, he had two fish. Barely enough fish to take care of everybody's personal hunger pains. And when you get the five-fold ministry with the power of agreement, somebody said, you're not supposed to use numbers in context. Listen, I told you I'm just talking about a transition. I'm just talking about something prophetically that leaps out of the pages of God's Word. I'm just telling you there are some sequences and some numbers in this miracle. You can take it or leave it. But I'm going to draw attention to it. The power of agreement. What happens? She can transpose in A-flat 
and somebody can play in B flat. If they transpose properly, everybody sounds right. If they don't transpose, it sounds like chaos. I've been in places where the right hand didn't know what the left hand was doing. Come on now. I've been in places where it sounded like chaos. And that's what happened here when he said, if any two will agree, that word is symphony in the original text, as touching anything, it shall be established and there shall be a sound like a symphony that comes up when everybody gets on the same page. So you got five-fold ministry, you got the power of agreement, and suddenly the number seven crops up, and that's the compilation of God. It's God's perfected number. He doesn't stop at seven, he turns around, and there's 12 wicker baskets full of the evidence of miracle working power of God because this little lad had an open hand in the presence of God. And notice what took place. There are 12 gates in the city. There are 12 manner of fruit on all sides of both sides of the city in heaven. Jesus was 12 in the synagogue. It was John the Baptist that put 12, they put 12 stones in the middle of the Jordan River. And he would baptize Jesus on the foundation of these 12 stones. But then Joshua would come along and he would say, we got to take these 12 stones out of the river. Are y'all with me? And we got to put it on the side of the Jordan River because this generation of her generation and these babies up on this stage will walk by one day and ask the question sister why are these stones here why are they here and they don't need a church to build a monument to it they don't need a church to memorialize it and put a man's name on it they don't need a church to somehow say we're locked into this particular box and this is the way it's always going to be now I preach with passion so don't get nervous I'm not going to I promise you I'm not going to hurt anybody today but you get as excited for the hogs I can get as excited for Jesus come on say amen and I'm coming by to tell you that Jesus and that Joshua said hey we told you about these stones we're not going to build a denomination to it we're going to put it back in the river because it's where these 12 stones the order of God determine the course and the force and the flow of the river of God and it's right there where John the Baptist would baptize Jesus can I tell you we need water hallelujah it's in the water where the, uh, where the order of God is yes. established and then on the hills of this Jesus said this little lad he gives his mess he gives his lunch to Jesus and here's what happened. He transfers little into much. There's a minute thing that transfers and there's a transition that takes place and anything that has to be used by God has to be lifted up to him first. He took the lunch and lifted it up. Hallelujah. Every perfected gift cometh down I'm talking about prophetic traits of this miracle. Every perfected gift cometh down from the Father of lights and in him there is no fairness and no shadow of turning. He not only he lifts it unto Jesus, but he breaks it. Can I tell you, you will never get a miracle in your life until you understand it's out of brokenness where there is a flow of God. God resists the proud and he holds them at arm's length. Can I tell you, the alabaster box in your life has to be broken so the sweet smell of the ointment of freshness can come from the devastation of your... God is not schizophrenic. He's not just messing with your emotions. He's just tired of pinning Pentecostal peacocks, kooky charismatics, and sensational seeker friendly. Come on now. He wants somebody to come broken in a contrite spirit and understand what James said when he said, when you draw nigh unto me in the original text, like a magnet, he said, I'll come to where you are. Hey, can I tell you, when God lifts it up and he breaks it and he blesses it, there will be a flow that will take place. Somebody say amen. Well, out of this reality, I'm almost there. Some of you can't wait. I'm almost there. There's a difference in a good sermon and a hostage. I'm probably teetottering right now. Amen? Amen. Here it is. Here it is. On the heels of this, now, he turns around and he says, set them down in ranks of 50. So you've got the five-fold ministry. You've got the power of agreement. You've got the perfected number of God. You've got blessing. You've got lifting up. You've got brokenness. You've got multiplication. Now you've got the order of God established. He said, sit on down in ranks of what? What's 50? you got Pentecost. For those of you who don't like to move with the Spirit, you're in a Pentecostal church. I've come by to tell you Pentecost 
will always bring multiplication. Pentecost will always cause growth. Pentecost will always bring deliverance. Pentecost will always bring power. Pentecost will always bring victory. Pentecost will all bring, always bring a harvest. Pentecost will always bring passion. Pentecost will always change lives. What are you talking about, Brother Claypool? I'm telling you the most unlikely key to this miracle, and it's starting to happen in the earth day, in the earth today, is going to come from our youth because Jesus said, suffer them to come unto me. This child had no predisposition. He just had an open hand in the presence of God. After all this sales, I'm going to the second point. You see the food now, and then the faith takes place, and all of a sudden, they give a message to this group of people that have been in a Signs and Wonders conference. Are you still with me? They say to them, all right, you've been in this Signs and Wonders conference. You've taken notes. You fell out. You've been prophesied over. You've been prophesied. Some folks prophesy over you, too. You fell out before you got up. You spoke in tongues. We've done everything we could do, Sister Tanya, to be called a Pentecostal spirit-filled service. And all that's wonderful. Amen. We, that's fine. But we got to listen to the parting words. He said, I want you to meet me on the other side. And this group could not transition from the loaves and the fish. It took a teenager to open the gate. And that's the move of God that's taking place in the earth today. But don't get mad at me, Grandma and Grandpa, because the Bible said the older women are teach the younger women. Yeah. The older men are teach the younger men. Yeah. There is an inner... Why can you go to Disney World together? Why can you have Christmas together? Why can you have all of these amenities together and have a family unit and then not come to church and give up some landscape and territory so we can see the kingdom advance? Oh, I'm preaching better than you're letting on. And here's the key. He said, I'm going to meet you on the other side. They're still back there at the Signs and Wonders conference. Please, those of you by Facebook, don't take this out on Brother Panky. This is just Brother Claypool. I will not be here next week. <laughs> Go to the phones. Hey, Amen. You know what I'm talking about. I'm joking. But here's the key. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, now the transition takes place. And they cannot, brother, get the message in their brain to move from the Signs and Wonders Conference to the point of the other side of the Savior. Jesus said, I will meet you there. They didn't hear that. It's called active listening. You ever been around somebody, you're talking to them, and they don't understand that uh, much conversation brings strife. There's a time to speak, not to speak. I've been around folks that will reach, almost feel like they reach into your larynx and put a valve on it. And they're talking right down in your inner space. Y'all have never experienced that, have you? I was raised by the chief. He had a personal zone. We love everybody. But how many knows that people have a personal zone and you don't just roll up on them? Maybe in Bible you all would understand that. You don't just roll up on the people. Amen. Right. Old, new, young, wherever. You know. I got a holler pass and a hood pass. How many knows what I'm talking about? Well, some of y'all catch that on your way to Walmart. Amen. My mom's in her 35th year of pastoring a church. They feed about 45,000 uh, about 4,000 people a month. They've got a rehab. My dad was a retired police chief and he was fair and worked with people. And for years, my mother worked in benevolence and worked in the jails and all those kind of things. And dad would arrest them and my mom would preach to them and most of them were my cousins. Amen. <laughs> but I said all that to say this. Jesus said, meet me on the other side. Yeah. And all of a sudden, about 3 a.m. to 6 a.m., a storm 24 hours after a miracle comes on yeah. the scene. Are you? I didn't know it would storm after a miracle. I thought we'd just stay in the signs of I would, you know, Katie Beth, I hadn't seen you a while, so I'm going to preach to you a little bit. I, I don't know if you felt like this as a teenager. God would help, help me and touch me in, in uh, my local church. I love my local church. But I'd just say, Lord, if I could live at Pink, that you can. If I could live at Winterfest and these youth, man, I could make it. You know, I got a good youth group and all that. But that's not what God's talking about. He wants you to be able to be stable and maturated wherever you are. He wants you to understand it's not what surrounds you, it's what's in you. I mean, he understands that. And he wants you to understand there's accountability and community. But as a teenager, I would say, you know, if I can just work those, if I can make it through the month of July to go four weeks of youth camp, I know I'm not going to miss the mark. Come on now. And I knew in fun time they were going to show a burning hell and a thief in the night. And it would be very hard for me to get a girl to go to the banquet with me because about the time I was getting ready to ask her, I'd go to the altar again during fun time. How many knows what I'm talking about? See, y'all have no clue what I'm talking about. That's okay. 
Jude said some are saved by fear. He's not talking about tactic. He's talking about respect. Yes. Yeah. There needs to be a godly revere and reverence come Amen. back to the church. So they could not understand this. And now, here's where we're at. All of a sudden, land lovers are telling them, don't leave the shore. Stay over here to the Signs and Wonders Conference. But you'll never get wet if you don't get out in the water. Because it's in the, I don't have time to preach there. It's in the water where the moving of the Holy Spirit is. It's not by might nor by power, but it's by my spirit. They push a few furlongs out into the middle of the night at 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. That's when the portal opens up for intercession. For those of you who know what it's like. The Holy Spirit begins to deal with you. All of a the sudden, there is an apparitionist, which is a ghost. And I'm almost there. I'm almost done. Stay with me. And there's a ghost. And there is a custom in the Capernaum and Sea of Galilee region that says that there was a man that was a captain of a boat. And, a, and, 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 he, and his boat was turned over. And he hates the, he, and he, and he hates the seashore. Boy, that's hard to say. He hates the seashore. And all of a sudden, they bow to a, a farce and a story. Yeah. And notice this. You've had a teenager that was the most unlikely one to have a key to a miracle. And all of a sudden, now, a new convert picks up by the name of Peter. I would have given that to a deacon or a pastor, an overseer, uh, an apostolic ministry. But Peter, brother basketball player, athletic man, he bragging on you. Peter would cut, he cut Malchus's ear off. He had an anger issue. Peter had a problem cussing. You might not want him as an elder right now. He hasn't, he hasn't received the baptism of love yet. How many knows what I'm talking about? He'll go, he'll go crazy on you in a moment. So you got a teenager that was a key to a miracle. And now you've got a new convert. You know why Peter could transition from a signs and wonders conference to a sea walker? Because he was like the man in the New Testament that owed 500 pence and another man owed 200 pence. The one that owed the months had the most gratitude. Some of us have forgotten the rock from which we were hewn, the pit from which we were digged. We've been so bound by religion and traditions that have stripped and made the word of God of none effect. We've forgotten that we had to walk out of darkness into marvelous light. We somehow think that God has secondary leaders in the church. And I'm talking to somebody in this room today that just got in the realm of grace. I may be further down the road than you. I may be further down the road with the baton, with the baton but I'm ready to pass it back to you because I've served my generation well. And can I tell you, Peter was not only, uh, he was a key to the miracle because he could see something that nobody else could see. And here's the key. If this new convert had not recognized the transition from the Signs and Wonders Conference to the Sea Walking Conference, come on here now, here's what happened. The Bible said Jesus would have passed by him and they would have missed the moment and the momentum. Can I tell you, some of us need a fresh anointing of the eye save of the Spirit place upon our eyes because we've been locked in one disposition of time so long we haven't seen anything in so long come on now it's been so long since the fresh touch of the Holy Spirit has touched us and encouraged some of you old time church of God people pray for me you know I'm telling the truth I've come by to tell you it is time for new wine to come on old wine skins it is time for us to get a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit it is time for us to get back in the water it's time for us the land lovers will tell you Peter got wet but Peter got, got not only got wet. He walked on something nobody else ever walked on before. The Word of God and Jesus caught him and brought him back to the boat and the storm ceased because the presence of God was enough this time, sir, because he didn't have to speak to it. His presence was enough. And when the dust was settled and I'm through, here's the last thing I want to talk about. After the teenager had the key to the miracle and Peter a guy that was jacked up that would later preach Pentecost because he said, I agape love you three times, even after he denied Christ. Now Jesus gets in the boat with us, maturated folks. Are y'all with me? Hopefully, hopefully nobody's mad. Are y'all with me? And here's what he said. Oh, ye of little faith. You consider not the miracles of the loaves because your heart was hardened. You couldn't see the forest for the trees. Could it be that God is saying to us in these last hours, 
we have to come to him like a little child with an open hand. Could it be that God is going to use the last, the lost, and the least because they know they need him the most? Come on. Come on. And could it be that God is wanting to shake the boat? And the land lovers will tell you, but yeah, Peter is jacked up. But Peter also walked on something that nobody else walked on. Peter's got some area for growth in his life. It's called the baptism of love. It's called sanctification. You ought to try it. It's called a big bowl of the fruit of the Spirit and the word of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. It's called, I'm not all that in the bag of chips. I'm in this journey and I'm moving towards God. And I don't want to be the one that sits in the boat. And he asked me, why wasn't you involved in this? Your heart was hardened. You just watched me feed a multitude with a little lad's lunch, Destiny. You just watched me transition from a signs and wonders conference to a sea walker. I almost passed that boat with all kinds of folks on it that had been in the same miracle. You had seen all of that transitional things take place, but yet your heart was hardened. And I had to talk to you because all you saw was me use a lad's lunch and feed a multitude. It's deeper than that. Are you with me? Can I tell you, in the earth today, God is raising up a people. He wants to touch the whole family unit. These babies don't need to wait until they're 18 years old to be saved and baptized in the Holy That's Spirit. Right. That's right. I'm not talking about being out of order. And listen, these young, uh, these new converts need to be involved in ministry. <coughs> yes, they will fall. Have you ever fallen? Yes. yes, they will miss the mark. Have you ever missed the mark? Amathea. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not talking about enmity. Enmity is that when you miss the mark and you don't repent, come on now, and you stay out of alliance with, some folks don't even understand soteriology, salvation. They don't understand a grasp. We got hyper faith and hyper grace. Come on now. We say that our, our, our sin nature is forever under, enslaved by sin and will never get free. If that's the case, put him back on the cross. It's time we preach doctrine in the church again. How many of those? I'm not talking about so that we have some hierarchy. Hierarchy, and we think we're better than anybody. He said in the last day there would be itching ears and seducing spirits and yeah. doctrines of devils. And if it were possible, some of you that have been on the boat for years, the elect could be to see. But I'm telling you, don't let your heart become stony. Don't let your heart become hardened. You've seen all of that in a bag of chips. You've seen the glory that they sing about. You've seen the healings that we sing about this morning. You felt the glorification of God at times in your life. But I'm telling you, don't miss this moment. God wants to raise up this young man's generation. And God wants to raise up new converts that are in the, in the process. And God wants to say to us, I don't want you out of the boat. I've come back one more time to tell you, you're in like Flynn, but you've got to get the stony heart touched. How many of you don't talk about? You've got to say, I've got to feel the warmth of the Holy Spirit because I want to be involved with the teenager that has an open hand. I want to be involved with the new convert that is seeing something nobody else can see. I want to be involved with that crowd that says, I may have missed it this time, but sister, I don't miss it anymore because there's a move of God that is taking place in the earth and we're standing on the brink of the premillennium in return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord is coming back to earth again. Hallelujah. Stand all over this room. I hope I didn't do much damage this morning, Brother Pinky. I got a real suspicion that you preach and teach and know you do the full counsel of God. And there's some of you in this room today. You may fit one of those areas. You may be a teenager that says, I want to sell out now. Don't wait till you're 50 years old, young man. Don't wait till God raises you up if he tarries and gives you great platforms to do great things for God. Start now. When you seek him now, he will find you. He said in Matthew, he said, seek first the kingdom of God. Just real quietly. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. And then those of you that may be like Peter, you just got in the race and some of you have some issues. I had a nephew one time that was preaching and when he was about eight years old, he said, they let him testify, sister. And he said, if you got an issue, God will give you a tissue. <laughs> yeah. 
You may be like Peter today. You just got in this thing and all of it's new to you. You still deal with some anger. You still deal with different things, but you're able to see some things. You've got gratitude because you know where God has brought you from. You may be a part of that crowd that was in the boat that Jesus said your heart was hardened, but you want him to take the presence of God and just wash you and bathe you afresh and anew because we need a miracle, folks. He said these signs shall follow them, not him. This is not about a personality, a denomination. It's not about a superstar. It's about the church. We've got to be salt and light. You can get out and pick it and do all these things. Listen, this world was never meant to come into the alignment with the word of God. They don't understand. They're blinded by the God of this world. Fighting them, being mean to them is not going to get it. We've got to be salt and light. How many understand that? They've got to see the distinct difference. They've got to see that young people can be involved in it. They've got to see that people that even been messed up are in the process and they're coming towards Jesus. And, and, and they've got a lot of baggage on them, have been accepted, and God has forgiven them. We're not accepting sin. We're not compromising. I may understand that. But we're opening up the gates, and we're saying, come in if you're heavy laden, if you're broken, if you're bruised. And some of you may not understand that. You won't understand it until it's your grandchild, or it's your niece, or your nephew, or it's someone you love. And then we've got to say to us that have been on the boat watching the miracle. We can't afford to think that we've somehow arrived and we have some kind of doctor's degree in spirituality and we don't need a fresh baptism of love, sister, just to wreck our heart so that we understand God wants the whole unit to be involved in a miracle. Kids are bowed and eyes are closed in this room today. No one's looking around. If you're not where you need to be with the Lord and you would say, Brother Claypool, if Jesus were to come today or death were to knock on my door, I'm not ready. But I would desire you to pray for me. Would you slip your hand up? I will not embarrass you. I will not bother you. But I'm, I am determined, Brother Pinky, not to have any services and offer give an altar call. Because eternity waits for no man. If you're in this room and you're not sure, lift your hand. Number two, if you're a young person and you say, today I want to sell out. I want to have an open hand in the presence of God. I'm in a journey. I understand that. I'm going through the processes of life. There have been times when I've tripped and I've fallen, but I want, to, I want to settle it now. I want to take him on the journey of life with me. I don't want to get down the road and, and, and bottom out and then, and I know he will come to me, but I want him to walk with me. I want him to talk with me. I want him to walk with me through my schooling. I want him to walk with me through my sports. I want him to walk with me through my relationships. I want him to walk with me through every area of my life. If that's you and you're a young person, come on right now. If you're in this room today and you identify with Peter and you just got in the race and you've had some issues and you need a tissue and but God has given you perception and you've been able to see and you're and you're grateful because he's touched you. I want you to come. If you're a part of that group that says, you know what? I can't see the forest or the trees because I've got a little complacent, I got a little cold and I've got so chloroformed by the cares of this life. Weeds have grown up in my life and the cares of life have overwhelmed me and I need to pluck some things up out of my life and give them to Jesus. I need the warmth of the Holy Spirit to touch my heart. If that's you, would you raise your hand? I need a fresh touch. If none of this applies to you and you want special prayer and you want a miracle, would you come? Hallelujah. All right, if everybody's okay, I want you to lift your hands right now and ask the Lord just to send a fresh breath of the Holy Spirit in this room to touch you and minister to you right now. Father, we ask you right now, all over this room, to let the Holy Spirit breathe on this place. Touch every aspect of this church, young and old. God, touch every aspect of this church, even those who are established. Lord, lay your hand upon them, strengthen them, I pray. Minister to them, I pray. God, we ask you to breathe on them. Father, I ask you to touch your man, your pastor today. Lord, his heart breaks for the things that breaks the heart of God. Lord, you know the places in this city, God, that he drives through and his heart is broken for the needs of the people. God, let this house be a house of mercy. Let this house be a house of grace. God, I pray for this young man with potential in his life, God, that you will always walk with him. You'll always be near him. God, that he will remember this day. God, he's making step towards you. God, you care. God, I pray for this established church that their hearts would be 
open. Lord, I pray for the mother-in-law today, God. You know the miracles that you've brought in her life. You know the strength, God, that you've given her in her life. God, I pray, Lord, that she will be, uh, be a beacon, God, salt and light and darkness in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for the music teacher there that Pastor told me about who walks the halls of our schools. God, protect her and protect our children. Somebody say amen here. Amen. Protect our children in Blytheville. Lord, let them see a difference in their life. Lord, I pray for grandmas and grandpas. I pray for those who have brokenness in their families and families that are discombobulated and, and disjointed and, 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 and their children and grandchildren, God, that may be confused today. Lord, let the precious Holy Ghost walk into that areas of their life and touch them. Lord, I pray for addictions to break. I pray for bondages to break. I pray for a fresh anointing to come upon them. Lord, I pray for Sister Tanya, Sister Katie Beth, God, as Sister Katie Beth moves into this next season of her life, God. Let this union be touched by the presence of God with purpose and anointing. They have prepared themselves academically. They have prepared themselves spiritually, God. Give them great success in the spirit and in the natural as well. God, we thank you for this place of worship today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Pastor, I'll be right here to the right if you would like to have special prayer. There's a specific part that he shared there near the end that just really hit me, and I want us to pray about it right now. Complacency is the enemy of God. It's the enemy of our walk with God. And I just want, I want us just to take a moment Many of us, some of us have been saved for a long time. But I want us to pray, you know, humility overcomes complacency. And I just want us to pray for just a moment. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus. God, it's easy for us to become complacent because we're used to you. We're used to certain things. But God, I pray that you would break down, that break down the walls of complacency in the spiritual realm, dear God, that we would that we would humble ourselves before you, dear God, and be willing to follow, dear God, your spirit. Lord, your word said it's not by mine, nor by power, but it's by your spirit, says the Lord, dear God. And Lord, your word says where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, not complacency, but there's liberty. And God, I pray in the name of Jesus, dear God, break every complacent thing out of our lives so that we can walk in you fresh. And we can walk in you new. In the name of Jesus, dear God, break it off of us. Let us, let us even this week, dear God, walk a different way. Lord, as, as we celebrate this week, a holy week, let it not just be another Easter coming up, but Lord, let us realize the price, the pain, but dear God, and the promise of it. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Your God is a good God. He does wonderful things. I want to ask you to do two things this week. If you'll look at me. If you'll do two things this week. One, I want to ask you to pray a little extra time this week. Ten minutes more a day about Easter service. He said, why don't you do that? It is an opportunity. There's an opportunity for whatever reason. There's an opportunity there. And then, not just pray about it, but you have to take steps yourself. Take one of those cards about somebody. Take your phone, text somebody. Go, go on, on, on Facebook and do whatever, however, whatever avenue you choose. We have so many different ways of being able to do that. Yes. And we're going to be talking, we're going to be sharing an evangelistic message, an opportunity. What if it's your son? What if it's your mom? What if it's your spouse? What if it's your neighbor that gets saved from Easter and changes their life completely? Would that be all right with you? Would that be all right with you if it's your friend? Would that be all right if it's somebody close to you? Absolutely. And so pick up one of those cards. They're out there in that foyer underneath the, um, underneath the iPad. Take them with you. If you can come back tonight at 6 o'clock for a World Missions Rally, World missions is special. Yes, yes. It is special. I've never met a missionary that didn't just bless my heart in such a way because those guys, they, they just, they, they had such a different 
thing yes, in their sir. life. Yes, sir. And I got saved during a revival that a war missionary was preaching. I, I got saved out in the country in Model Arkansas by a world, when a world missionary shared the gospel message. And I thank God for that world missionary who's now going to be with the Lord. Wow. Um, that, that preached the message that, that brought me in. Um, so I love world missions. I love world, even if it impacts life, and it should, and it will. Bishop, thank you so much. Listen, he came here in physical pain, but to share with you guys. Give him a hand clap. I do a great word. A great word. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I pray your blessings over these precious people. I pray, dear God, that you that, that, that you will bless them in ways that they never could even imagine, dear God. The Lord, that wherever they go, you're going to walk with them. You're going to bless them. And they're going to know, dear God, that they are blessed. Their children are blessed. Their children's children are blessed because you walk with them in Jesus' name. Amen. Hug somebody's neck. Bless them. Tell them you're glad you got to see them today. And go pick up one of those cards and invite somebody to the house of God. God bless you.